Jim, I will introduce myself. Uh, those of you that don't know, I'm Dr. Daniel Batchelor. I'm an uh, assistant professor here at uh, Florida Tech. I'm also the director of the Olin Observatory. Uh, Dr. Matt Wood, who you are probably uh, most familiar with, has since uh, taken a more lucrative offer at uh, Texas A&M Commerce. He's now the head of uh, physics and astronomy there. So um, for his uh, dedication and commitment to the Astronomy and Astrophysics Public Lecture Series, uh, we are recording this. He will probably, hopefully, uh, look at the YouTube video of this talk, and I would, I would, I would hope that you would all uh, show your appreciation to what uh, Dr. Wood has done over the past years with a, with a round of applause. Okay, that being said, we're going to dive straight into uh, the new um, uh, year with uh, our very own Dr. Mark Barment. He's been at Florida Tech since 2000. He's a, uh, a professor of physics. He's most well known for his work with the Large Hadron Collider. And this evening, he is going to update us on the exciting developments that we've had over the summer with regards to the uh, Higgs-like uh, signature that has been found at that particular detector. So please, Dr. Barment. Uh, in your own time. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Batchelder, and thank you all for uh, coming uh, to this presentation this, uh, this evening. Um, I was actually uh, here presenting what we at the time thought uh, were early signals and tantalizing evidence for this uh, particle that we have been searching for for over uh, a good 20 years now in different experiments, not this particular experiment that I'm describing tonight. Um, <clears throat> so for those of you who actually um, came to that talk, you will see some slides which look familiar. Um, I actually just took that old talk and updated it with the new results that we have. And... Uh, <clears throat> Let me just mention uh, what I'm going to try to do um, <clears throat> in my talk. I'm going to talk about the concept of mass. And then in, uh, related to this, of course, we have to look at the mass at subatomic level. So we talk about our standard model of particle physics, which describes what subatomic particles do and how they interact. And then, of course, we go to the uh, uh, hunting for the Higgs boson, which is the only missing element or missing piece of this uh, standard model. And then I come to my conclusions. Uh, this view graph here, in fact, shows you a snapshot of a real collision of two protons, which have collided head on at this point right here. Uh, all the stuff that you see coming out of that collision are tracks of particles producing the collision, and these towers show energy deposition in various parts of our detector. So I'll say, of course, more about these uh, as we go on. The concept of mass and why things do weigh. Clearly, in uh, everyday life, uh, you have experienced for yourself that if, uh, if you try to, uh, say, push this table here, you feel resistance and inertia. So that actually allows us to define an inertial mass, which is simply the ratio of the force you exert on that object over how much accelerated it becomes. <clears throat> so that's a simple uh, expression that we have actually used in physics for many, many years, way back to uh, uh, early um, <coughs> 15th or 16th century. Gravitational mass, <coughs> on the other hand, of course, is when you have some object in the gravitational field of, say, uh, Earth, um, <coughs> it weighs something, and if you divide it by the gravitational acceleration, you could call that the gravitational mass. We believe that these two masses must be the same. In fact, principal equivalence uh, requires it, and it has been tested to very high precision. And as a matter of fact, general theory of relativity requires that these two masses would be the same. But after all, this is a superficial way of defining what the mass is. 
because we know objects are made of atoms. <clears throat> so if you really want to know what the mass is and where it comes from, you have to look and see what happens with the subatomic particles. And if you like, at the micro level, what mass means. <clears throat> Turns out that, in fact, mass becomes a fundamental property of these subatomic particles. And just to give you an example, electron, which of course we all know about, has a mass of, uh, in these units, which are mega electron volts over C squared, C being the speed of light, it uh, has a mass of about one half. Perhaps in more familiar units in kilogram, it's that number there, about 10 to the minus 30 kilograms. Proton, another particle that we could uh, uh, discuss in terms of uh, uh, something that we, of course, deal with on an everyday basis, uh, um, and we are made of it. <coughs> that, that weighs about uh, just about one giga electron volts. That actually the mass is. But then the question is, why is the mass of protons so different from the electron, or for that matter, from all the other subatomic particles that we know of, which I will show you in a minute? So that really is the uh, crux of what we are talking about. Where does this mass come from, and why are they so different from one particle to another? So that takes me to uh, the standard model of particle physics which is, if you like, the, uh, the periodic table, the modern-day periodic table of what these particles are and what their inter interactions they have. It's actually a relatively simple picture. Right here in this view graph, you can see on this side, uh, I listed the matter particles, leptons, electron is one of those. <clears throat> another uh, lepton, which is like the heavy brother of this, we call it muon, and yet another more massive one, we call it tau. And these are the associated neutrinos with these three leptons, electron, neutrino, muon, neutrino, and tau neutrino. In this block here, we have quarks. They have somewhat funny names, up, down, charm, strange, top and bottom, six of those. And these particles actually uh, interact very strongly with each other. And just to give you an example, the proton that I mentioned before is made of two of these U quarks and a D quark. If you combine those, two, these, those three quarks, that composite particle is a proton. So then, of course, if you put that proton with an electron together, you could actually make a simple atomic structure, which would be obviously the hydrogen atom. And as such, then, all the atomic structure that we know is made up, of course, protons and neutrons. And those protons and neutrons, as we said, are made of these quarks. So these are indeed the building blocks of all the matter that we know at least the visible matter that we know in nature. On this side, I have the so-called force particles. These particles, which are like W and Z bosons, photon and gluon, these are the particles which actually carry the interaction, carry out the interaction between these particles. They are the mediators of, of the interactions. And as you recall, there are four fundamental interactions, what we call strong interactions, which are when these guys interact with each other. Then we have weak interactions. We have electromagnetic interactions. And then we have eventually the gravity, which, by the way, as I noted here, is not included in the so-called standard model of particle physics. That's a, a one of the ongoing areas of research is, in fact, uh, to try to find a way to marry gravity and these other forces that we talked about. In the middle there, that's the missing piece that we are looking for. It's the Higgs boson. 
It's the agent that gives mass to all of these particles. At least that's the way we um, formulated this standard model of particle physics. And uh, as such, that's going to be the topic of my talk. So we want to know whether this exists, and if so, what properties it has. <clears throat> Just uh, before I leave this, um, this standard model of particle physics really is a crowning achievement of 20th century. Many areas of physics have contributed to it, but in uh, principle, quantum mechanics and the special theory of relativity play the biggest role in putting this together with all the observed particles and, and uh, uh, which we have discovered so far. So, Let's talk about the Higgs mechanism, which, uh, which brings about the, uh, the mass uh, in these particles. This was actually uh, theorized by, uh, by uh, Peter Higgs, a, a British physicist who actually lives in Scotland, in 1964. And in fact, it's a relatively simple idea. He just assumed that all space is filled with a so-called Higgs field. And as such, other particles, as they traverse this field or swim through it, they interact with the field and acquire mass. Like every other field that we deal with in our theory of quantum field, quantum fields, there's obviously then a boson or if you like, a quantum of that field that should exist. So for the Higgs field, we have a Higgs boson, which we call it, uh, or we denote it by this uh, capital H. And uh, it's like a more familiar field that we all know about, electromagnetic field, has photon as its quantum or its carrier. So. Existence of this Higgs field requires existence of a Higgs boson. And what we do in our experiments, of course, is to try to find this Higgs boson, which would then be considered as evidence for existence of this Higgs field, and as such, the origin of the mass, because as we said, the particles, as they interact with the field, they acquire mass. The best way to give a simple example of what we mean by this particles swimming through the field and acquiring a mass is to talk about this situation of if you have, let me say, a bowl of water and you take a spoon and try to steer the spoon in the water, you feel very little resistance and you could consider that the spoon feels light to you as you steer the water. But now, fill the bowl with honey, for example, and then try to steer the spoon. You'll see that you have to actually now be a little bit more forceful to make this spoon go around. And as such, the spoon may actually, well, it would feel heavier or more massive to you. So you could consider now uh, honey to be the field, in particular the Higgs field, and particles are like the spoon that you were steering the honey with. So they interact, and as such, the particle acquires a mass. And the Higgs boson can be thought of the molecules in that honey that of course, produce this resistance to the spoon. As such, we could think of it as having a field in that bowl of honey. So that's the kind of analogy that one could use to, to try to put this in a, a simple way that we can kind of understand uh, how it works. Now, the theory that he proposed 
uh, is actually quite precise in terms of what this Higgs boson should behave, what properties it should have. But what, miss what is missing is any information on the, at least any precise information on the mass of the Higgs boson itself. Because the boson itself could actually be massive. So unfortunately, the, the theory doesn't tell us anything about that. And we will see the consequence of this in terms of what we need to do to search for this Higgs boson then. Now, before I go back, uh, before I go to how we search for it, let me step back in time a little bit and see what the Higgs boson has done in terms of evolution of our universe. What you see here, the history of the universe, is, uh, of course, the famous Big Bang event that happened about 14 billion years ago. We had the inflation era and then a number of different era where you actually have different particles produced. Eventually these particles combine to, for example, these are these little balls with QQQ. They are the composite particles which are made of combination of different quarks. And uh, as you go on, and of course as we go on in this direction, the universe is cooling from the Big Bang all the way to present day. You can see some of the numbers here. The temperatures expected in this era was about 10 to the 32 degree Kelvin. <clears throat> of course, in our present day, we expect about 3 degree Kelvin. So as the universe is cooling off, then more and more combined, Particles were produced and eventually they bulk together and they, they produce uh, molecules and uh, atoms and molecules and eventually then we get into large scales of uh, uh, stars and galaxies and of course here where we, uh, we think of our present day, we still have, uh, <coughs> uh, these are presumably the photons. Uh, but we have like the solar system here and black holes and, and of course uh, human beings and all the other stuff that we see in nature are over here. So this is our brief history of the universe as it evolves and goes from the Big Bang all the way to present time <clears throat> in this cartoon, if you like. And um, what is uh, theorized in terms of Higgs boson is that at some point in this era here, some of the energy formed this Higgs field that we we're talking about. And all these particles which were traveling through this Higgs field eventually acquired mass. And as such, they slowed down. Because if you have no mass, like the photon, you're then traveling with the speed of light. In order for you to slow down, you have to acquire mass which the Higgs field can give you. And then as such, the particles could actually combine to form heavier composite particles like proton and neutrons, and then eventually atoms and everything else that follow. So, if you ask yourself, what if we didn't have the Higgs field, or for that matter, the Higgs boson, what would happen? Well, the bottom line is that we would not exist. Somebody told me that, well, that's proof of uh, existence of the Higgs boson, but <laughs> I don't know if we could take it. <laughs> but, as I said, what happens is that you need this agent, this Higgs field, to give you mass to the building blocks of our, our matter. And as such, if you don't have it, then quarks would not combine into protons and neutrons. Protons and neutrons would not combine with electrons to make atoms. Consequently, atoms would not combine to make molecules and ordinary matter, so then the whole thing falls apart and this here is supposedly what the universe would look like if we didn't have the Higgs field. 
Well, that's my imagination, by the way. <laughs> All right, so, so the role of the Higgs field and the Higgs boson is really super critical in the way we understand the evolution of the universe. So this, this, this is really a major, major fundamental property of matter and, and evolution of our universe. All right, so it has been 40 years, a little over than 40 years that this was proposed by Peter Higgs. As I mentioned, many, many experiments have been looking for it. But uh, so far up to this year, with little success. And the question was, has always been where and how to find this missing piece. So this takes me to the instruments that you need to find this particle. And that is, of course, the particle accelerator. Particle accelerators play a significant role in the way we do our sciences. For the reasons that I have listed here, they play the role of a microscope because you could actually explore deep inside very little spaces uh, by shooting very energetic particles to that uh, region. So it's like looking inside that region and as if it's like uh, you're looking with a microscope. This is thanks to, of course, the famous de Broglie equation which relates momentum to, or for that matter, energy to one over size. So the higher energy you have, the smaller sizes you could actually explore. You could also, using particle accelerators, produce new particles that are not normally produced in nature these days. And this is, of course, thanks to Einstein with E equal mc squared, because again, the higher energy allows you to produce higher masses in case these new particles are massive. And finally, you could also use it as a telescope, because we could, as I showed you in that view graph, in stepping back in time, you could actually create with higher energies, higher temperatures, and as such, recreate the conditions of the universe when uh, uh, it was in early stages of its evolution. And that's, of course, thanks to Boltzmann, which uh, related energy and temperature. So observing and measuring phenomena not observable in everyday experience, like in, uh, in, uh, in, in, the day, in, in our, if you like, laptop experiments or uh, tabletop experiments, I, sh I should say, requires um, uh, particle accelerators, or can be done at least by particle accelerators. And it can be done in a controlled way. That's another very important feature, that particle accelerators allow you to do experiments in a very controlled way so you know what you're getting. Now, speaking of particle accelerator that we use, uh, uh, and that is called the Large Hadron Collider, LHC, which I know that uh, you have heard about lately. Uh, this is actually located in um, Switzerland, and uh, in this, if you like, is a map of uh, Switzerland. This is Geneva here. And uh, this is the um, uh, famous Lac Le Mans. And uh, the accelerator is like a tunnel underground, about uh, 300 feet underground. And um, as you can see, there are like different um, experiments that are installed on this tunnel to study the collisions of the protons that we circulate in, in, this, uh, in this machine. This is a picture of the, what the machine looks like. These are a series of dipole magnets. Uh, so, of course, you inject protons into these dipole magnets, and the role of these magnets, of course, is to keep the protons circulating and steer them around the ring. So in this here, you could see that there are actually two rings. And these uh, yellow balls here 
represent like bunches of protons, so there are like about 10 to the 11 protons per bunch. And there is like a train of these bunches, one going clockwise and one going counterclockwise. You bring them to collide at certain points, and those points, of course, are, are where you install your detectors so you could study the collisions. Um, what I can say is that, of course, uh, this is the world's uh, most powerful particle accelerator, at least at this time. This ring is about 27 kilometers round, and as I said, it's underground by about 100 meters. These proton bunches, cr the crossing rate of these proton bunches is about 40 megahertz. So there are like 10 to the 7 to 10 to the 9 collisions per second. So they generate these collisions, which we could then use uh, before I go on. By the way, with these collisions, we can recreate conditions which existed in this era in the evolution of the universe. So we have gone really stepping back in time to all the way to here. You know, remember, looking with telescopes in the sky, you can only go back to about here. With particle accelerators, we could recreate conditions which were actually existing at this time in the evolution of the universe. So we go back way, way, all the way over here. Now, this is an aerial view of the uh, European Center for Particle Physics, or CERN. And uh, this is supposed to show you where the ring is, of course, again, underground. Uh, quite a bit of it is actually in the neighboring France, but some of it is in Switzerland. And the interaction regions where we have the um, collisions happening are instrumented by these two, what we call general purpose detectors. This is the compact muon solenoid. Uh, we are actually a member of this collaboration and we work on this experiment. Florida Tech is an um, institute involved with this experiment. We do have a sister experiment called ATLAS. They are supposed to study proton-proton collisions as well as heavy ion collisions and they are supposed to really look for just about anything that nature can throw at us. The design of these detectors are, uh, um, is such that you could really do a lot uh, and not just look for the Higgs boson. Uh, there's a whole host of physics that you can study, like uh, search for uh, extra dimensions, supersymmetric particles, um, why uh, there is uh, matter, the universe is made of matter and not antimatter. Some of these fundamental questions we could address with these experiments. We do have actually two other experiments on this uh, accelerator, the so-called LHCb, which is focused on uh, CP violation and D physics. CP violation is actually the mechanism by which we could perhaps explain the asymmetry of universe being made of matter and not uh, equal parts, or, or why not just antimatter. And then there is actually a dedicated experiment called ALICE, which uh, looks at heavy ion collisions. Uh, just uh, an interesting uh, uh, set of numbers that one could actually give about uh, this particular accelerator. It generates a lot of data each year, obviously, from all these experiments. It's about like 15 million gigabytes of data. And uh, just to give you a sense of what that uh, really entails, uh, if you write these data on CDs, it would be one and a half times the height of Mount Everest if you stack them up. So that's the amount of data that is produced in just one year. A bit of uh, sociology of the collaboration that we are involved with, the CMS. Um, it has uh, a little over than uh, uh, 3,380. In fact, the number is a little old now. It keeps going up. We have more and more people who are interested in joining, uh, scientists, engineers, and students, uh, a good number of students, 
who are doing actually great work in terms of producing PhDs and, uh, and doing a lot of the physics analysis. Um, 173 institutes from 40 countries, so you can imagine it's a very international organization uh, to do this type of work, or collaboration, I should say. And U.S. is actually a big participant with about 50 institutes uh, in, in the collaboration, which only, of course, a fraction of people are in this photograph. I'm actually in there somewhere. I can't remember where I was. <laughs> A bit more about the experiment. As I said, you know, you have a huge rate of interactions. In fact, one billion interactions of these protons per second. Um, <clears throat> and, and of course, these interactions result in a thousands of particles streaming through your detectors. So your detectors have to have many channels. In fact, the CMS happens to have about 100 million channels which record passage of these particles in one way or another. This is actually an exploded view of the detector. And uh, it's a large detector. You can scale it by looking at the size of a person standing here. It's actually about the size of one of these buildings on campus. Um, it weighs a lot. It actually weighs about uh, 14,000 tons. And uh, the collisions are supposed to happen in the center of the detector and particles, uh, as they emerge, and you can see in here, for example, these yellow tracks are charged particles, which we have recorded by detectors inside. And then these towers, either in blue or red, are energy depositions in the calorimetry uh, around these uh, tracking devices. And we could actually re register passages of muon uh, by these muon detectors on the on the outside, which blanket the experiment. There is obviously um, uh, uh, high radiation levels in such an environment. So all the electronics that we use to register passage of these particles and these detectors have to be very radiation hard or tolerant, so they won't die after just uh, uh, a year or so. These experiments are designed to run for a number of years. This is a picture of the experiment. If you look um, at a cross section of it, you can see it's large. You know, these are different floors. There's like five story building here. And uh, it cost about $550 million to build this experiment. It's a very complex. And the irony of it is that we are looking at subatomic particles, but the instrument is this gigantic uh, giant there. <laughs> I do have a, I hope this works, I do have a uh, little animation to show you what the particle, what the detector looks like in layers of different types of detectors being put together. So what you are looking at is in the very beginning we had silicon uh, pads and strips which again charge particles passing through. They actually register their passage. Then um, this is the inner tracking volume. Then we actually have the um, um, outer tracking volume. And then we have the, uh, this I believe is the solenoid, uh, uh, the magnet which produces the magne magnetic field. Then we have the calorimetry in there. And these are the muon chambers. This is going too fast for me to follow it. <laughs> so, so what's happening of course is that these are different layers as put together and making up the, the experiment. And now what it's going to show you is that if, uh, of course, you have the two beams coming, and they are coming along this axis. And OK, there they come. And they collide. They produce the particles. And these particles, of course, swim through the detectors. And we register their passage. From the information that we have, we can determine what type of particle it was. Um, the energy and the momentum of these particles. So we, we can actually then reconstruct from that information what happened in that particular collision. 
Again, just to give you a sense of how complicated this detector is and how huge it is, let me show you this uh, little animation. Well, no, this is actually a movie. Wait a second. Um, the detector was assembled on surface and then lowered, and this is actually a part of it, not the entire detector. It was actually lowered down to the um, cavern down uh, underground. The lowering was done with a crane, which was, uh, um, uh, which could actually lower something as big as uh, uh, a few hundred tons. And it took 24 hours for this part of the detector to be lowered down. And as you can see, there's not a whole lot of room for this thing to wiggle. This piece itself, I think, actually weighed over two or 300 tons by itself. And, uh, and it was actually, it had to be done very slowly in a very controlled way, all the way to the ground level. This is actually where the cavern is. So uh, that's the kind of engineering, by the way, that goes into building these uh, detectors. Um, a lot of times physicists become engineers or engineers become physicists when we come together to do these type of things. Okay, enough about the instruments that we need. Let me move on to um, how we're going to actually find this, uh, this particle. Um, I'm not going to go through the details of this. This is just to give you a feel for the fact that we have a theory. Theory is very clear about how you would actually produce this particle, this Higgs boson. These are the different mechanisms that it can be produced. These funny little diagrams are the so-called Feynman diagrams, which one could use to calculate how often these things are produced. Those calculations actually are shown in this view graph here. But remember, as I said, we do not know, or the theory does not provide the mass of the Higgs boson. So what you need to do is to calculate for every single one of these productions as a function of the mass of the Higgs, the rate that it's produced. This is, if you like, the rate that it's produced as a function of the mass of the object. So this is all good and easy, relatively easy. People, the theorists can do these calculations and produce these, uh, these, uh, measure, these uh, um, results for us. And uh, down here, I just mentioned that, for example, for the mass of 120, and we'll see why 120, um, given these production rates that we have talked about here, you actually expect to have a, a Higgs boson produced in every 10 seconds when you operate this uh, accelerator. So it's not going to be very many Higgs bosons produced. There are many collisions, but not that many Higgs bosons being produced. Once you produce it, then you have to worry about what it happens to it. What happens to it in the sense that a lot of these particles are unstable. They disintegrate into something else. As we say, they decay into something else. And in this view graph, you could actually see that uh, uh, the Higgs boson, again, as a function of its mass, it could decay into a whole host of different uh, particles. For a low mass, like around uh, 120 or so, it could actually go into a pair of photons. It could go into a pair of uh, bottom quarks, and etc. You could actually follow through and see what it does. And this actually allows us to find or to put together a strategy for looking for, for the particle. Because what we have to do is, for example, in case of the Higgs boson decaying into two photons, we have to find two very clean photons in our detector, which if you put together their energy and momentum, it peaks around a mass, which is, say, for example, in this case, like about 100 or so. So um, this... Basically, these results of how the object decays can be used to put together a strategy for search for the Higgs boson. 
and we have strategies for low mass Higgs boson, intermediate and high mass Higgs bosons. And in a nutshell, they are actually given here. In this region of mass, one would focus on looking for the Higgs boson decaying into BB bar, which is like a pair of B quarks or bottom quarks. This a slightly larger region, we look for photons, two photons. Here we look for two W bosons. And here we look for, in this widest range actually, for two Z bosons. So there are different mechanisms or different ways of looking for this. And they're all independent because as such, now of course the particle can decay in this region to any of these, but as such, we could look for them independently. So uh, here let me kind of summarize what I just said in terms of the Higgs portfolio that CMS has put together. Again, depending on the mass, you have different modes that you could look for. So there's like eight different modes here that one could look for this object depending on its mass. However, it turns out that three of these modes, as listed here, to two photons, two Ws, and two Zs, look most promising because they show most sensitivity to being able to identify the object and measure its mass, which is, of course, the goal of this exercise. Not only just identify, but also we want to measure the mass. So we focus on these three, in particular these two, which is what I'm going to talk to you about now. Here is actually a candidate event for when the Higgs decayed into two photons. This is a real collision. What you see is, in fact, uh, these dotted lines are presumably the track that the photon took in order to get to the calorimetry or calorimeter and then deposited its energy, which is this green tower here. Obviously, there's no track in the tracking system because photon is neutral. These yellow tracks here present uh, charged particles as they go through the uh, tracking system. So there are two of these. And as you can see, the event is very quiet and clean. That's all there seems to be happening in this collision. You could use such events to reconstruct, as we say, the mass of the two photon system. Because we know the energy and, and momentum of these photons. We can measure them. We could put those, those two together and look at what they look like uh, in, in these collisions that we have actually studied with uh, this, this gives the details of collisions at 7 TeV and collisions at 8 TeV. These are data that we took in 2011 and 2012. What is plotted is just that mass of the two photon system. These different colors here show you the bands expected for known standard model processes. We generally refer to them as background because, of course, our signal is signal coming from the Higgs. And the red, which is actually shown here in a, a larger view inset, shows what one would expect if there is a signal. And these points are the data. So as you can see, in fact, the data seem to agree with presence of a signal here. Here, it's like dropping as we go with the um, expectation for the background. But there's a deviation here, the little bump, which shows presence of something happening there. Some resonance, as we say sometimes, which of course could be this Higgs boson, which decayed into two photons. Another way of looking at this is to ask yourself, what is the 95% exclusion, 95% confidence level exclusion for a standard model Higgs? It may look actually complicated, but let me simplify it in the following way. If there were no Higgs, what you would expect to see in this plot is this dotted red line. These bands of green and yellow show you 
fluctuations that you might expect on this red dotted line. And the black line here is what we observe, again, as a function of the Higgs mass. What you notice is that as long as the black line is within these green and yellow band, you could convince yourself that there's really no signal and all of this behavior here is due to fluctuations of data that you have collected and the backgrounds that you expect. However, if the black line actually goes out of these regions, and you could see certainly that that's what's happening over here, then you could no longer claim that this is due to fluctuations and as such perhaps background has generated this fluctuation. Now here you could be sure that there is actually something in addition to what you expected if there were no Higgs. And this is the kind of plot that we're going to be looking at for different uh, decay modes that we're going to look at. But the bottom line here is that just based on the Higgs to two photon, we could see that there is evidence for something being produced at around 125 GeV, both in this plot and in this plot. Looking at another decay channel or decay mode, this is where the Higgs decays into two Z bosons, and each of those would decay subsequently to two muons. So at the end, you have four muons in your event, in the collision. So here's another real collision. These yellow tra uh, sorry, the, the red tracks are actually trajectories of the four muons emerging from the collision. And these other view graphs actually show you in detail the fact that all four muons are coming from a single collision. And you could actually see that if you pair them together and reconstruct the mass, two of them give you a mass of 91, which is consistent with the mass of the Z boson. And the other two give you a mass of 35, which is consistent with a virtual Z boson. So, actually, let me show you one more uh, event of this type for the two electrons. And these two trajectories, the red trajectories for the two muons. <clears throat> so this is yet another candidate for uh, potentially a Higgs decaying into a pair of Z bosons. We could do the same exercise now, combine the masses of these four objects, either four muons or two muons and two electrons <coughs> or four electrons and look at here generically we call them four leptons and look at what they, uh, they show us. In this view graph what you see in fact is uh, the data that we have collected um, both in 2011 and 2012 and these are these uh, points you are comparing them with the standard model processes that you know of, without, of course, the Higgs, as your background. And expectation for a Higgs of 126 GeV, if it happened to have a mass of 126 GeV. And what you could see is that the data does have a little peak here, which indeed coincides with a Higgs boson of 126 GeV. The same thing can be seen again in this exclusion plot as we call them. And once again we see that the, the, uh, the, the black line and those points as you can see are the measurements. They actually exceed these bands that go outside of these bands indicating that there's actually something going on there. There is some excess of events over what you would expect from the backgrounds or the standard model processes without the Higgs. Now, to make a long story short, there are different decay modes that I mentioned to you. 
You could do this exercise for all of them and then take all the results and combine them. If you do that combination, this is what you're going to get in terms of the um, exclusion plots as a function of the Higgs mass. And what we observe is that consistently from all the decay modes, we see some excess around the 125 GeV mass. In fact, uh, <coughs> uh, normally people talk about 95% confidence level, but you could even go tighter to go all the way to 99 or practically 100%, and you could still, well, with 100%, maybe it's hard to see, but certainly even with 99%, we see that this, this excess is there. So as such, uh, by the way, this is yet another um, view of this. <coughs> so what we could say is that um, what we observe is that there is no indication of any excess of events in this range of mass from 110 to 122, or in this range of mass from 127 to 600 GeV. But there's something happening in this neighborhood of 125. <clears throat> now let's characterize this excessive uh, events that we see near 125 GeV. By the way, 125 GeV is like mass of 125 protons. Proton, remember, the mass of the proton is, is like 1 GeV. So this particle that we have discovered is quite a bit more massive than anything that we know, except with the, uh, with the exception of um, top quark, which is about 170 GeV. <coughs> anyway, to, to summarize, this excess that we see, and if we just focus on high sensitivity decay modes, which are the two photons and the four leptons, as I just showed you, what we see is that there is actually a significant excess in case of just the photons themselves, it's like four sigma excess. In case of four leptons, it's about three sigma excess. When you combine the two and the fact that they really come both with excess around the same mass, 125, the combined significance is five sigma. Now, okay, for those of you who may not be familiar with what we mean by this five sigma, let me mention that in a nutshell, what it tells you is that the chance of this signal that we have observed being due to <clears throat> some fake instrumental effect or perhaps to fluctuations of background events or the known standard model events is one in a million. So this this is how certain we are that we have observed something new. Now, one in a million is actually quite a, a dramatic number as well because let me give you another example to give you a, a feel for that. If you flip a coin, what is the chance of getting ahead? Say one half, right? Now, what if you flip the coin twice? What is the chance of getting two heads in a row? See, now, of course, the chance becomes a lot smaller. It's like one half to the second power, right? Now, what if you actually continue to flip the coin and you get 20 rows, 20 heads in a row? 20 heads in a row. That's actually this number. So that's how unlikely it is that this signal that we have observed comes from something fake or comes from just known processes fluctuating up to look like a signal. This view graph here actually shows you exactly what I have described in a more technical quantity, which we call p-value. I'm not going to bother with it, but it's, it's, uh, it's more like scientific way of what I just told you to express how unlikely it is that this is due to fluctuations of background. So it's truly a... A, a discovery. Something new is happening there. <clears throat> but the, the question that you have to ask yourself is, 
well, is this really compatible with the Higgs boson that we started off with? You know, we wanted to find the Higgs boson. We have discovered a particle of 125 GeV mass. How compatible is it with being a standard model Higgs boson, which is the missing piece that we were looking for? Well, to tell you the truth, as much as we have managed to investigate, it seems very compatible, but there is a lot of work to be done to be absolutely sure. It is a scalar particle, it is a boson, but as such, um, there are many different aspects of this that we still have to measure to be sure that it is the, the standard model Higgs boson. This is the reason why all the official announcements have been Higgs-like particle or Higgs-like boson. We still have a lot of work to do. But one thing that has been already done is to compare with what you might actually expect if it were the Higgs boson with a mass of 125. And in fact, this band here shows you that expectation with a certain fluctuation, 68% confidence level band. And we can see that it does indeed peak at 125 as expected. So in that sense, it is compatible with a standard model. In fact, the ratio of the cross-section we measured for this compared to a standard model is about 0.8 with that large error, so it is compatible to, with one. We see the same strength in the 7 TeV and 8 TeV data, so that's actually yet another uh, confirmation that it is the same particle and it is consistent with the uh, standard model. And we have, of course, looked for it in different decay modes, and they seem to all be very consistent with each other. So, so far, all indications point to this being the standard model Higgs boson. But as good scientists, you have to always wait until you have all proofs, and you are absolutely sure which, of course, is the next step in our program. So to conclude, the CMS experiment uh, does observe a new boson with a mass of about 125 GV at five sigma significance. In fact, our sister experiment, ATLAS, does actually observe the same. And that's the beauty of two, having two experiments, in fact, by design. Always in these type of experiments, we have two independent experiments so that they can cross-check each other. As expensive as that may be, but that's the way you have to do it so that uh, we don't end up discovering something which then uh, is completely uh, um, uh, um, unobserved by anybody else. <clears throat> so, so this is good that Atlas confirms also uh, or they also see the, 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 uh, the new boson. And the new boson is compatible with the standard model 125 GV, but we need to look at the additional data that we are taking, and uh, obviously more and better refined analyses to help clarify that, uh, uh, that it is really the standard model Higgs. And let me show you a bunch of happy people <laughs> who uh, well, as you can see, uh, they are super happy about the fact that, you know, you have to realize that for most of these folks, at least the older ones, um, this was a, a labor of love for them for maybe 10 to 15 years. So this is the culmination of all that hard work to actually see that something uh, that we have discovered, something that we have been looking for for all these years. And just to close, That's my little son who is trying to join the party, but doesn't know what's going on here. <laughs> All right, thank you. Any questions? I know, but that's why. I <laughs> we, have, we do have time for a couple of questions. Yes, sir. Is there any way that they used to do this stuff on that film, like X-ray film, you know? In the old days, uh, people actually did experiments with so-called bubble chambers. Right, right. 
and you would actually photograph what happens in the bubble chamber because as particles were passing through, they would actually produce these bubbles which would actually follow the passage so it becomes a track. Right. And you photograph that and you could actually look at those. It only works with very uh, low rates because you actually have to photograph that. And uh, at the same time, um, you could not really scale it up to such big things that we are doing here. You know, the biggest bubble chamber was about maybe a quarter of the size of this room. So you cannot really scale it up to what we need here. So it, it's no longer used, actually, as such. But in the old days, yes. That's actually a lot of discoveries back in the 50s and 60s were done like that, using bubble chambers. Yeah? Yeah, I read in some articles that there may be more than one Higgs boson, and mm -hmm. I'm wondering if they saw any evidence of that, how that would fit into the That's exactly one of the points that we need to investigate. There are extensions of the standard model which has more, um, they have actually a whole host of Higgs bosons. Not only, in fact, neutral ones, which is the case for this one, but also even charged Higgs bosons. And what you need to do is, of course, now to make sure that um, if there is a set of these Higgs bosons, which would be actually quite interesting because then it tells you right away that the standard model at least in this aspect, is incorrect. So that's actually one of the things that we have on our to-do list, to see if there are additional Higgs bosons, and as such, uh, that search must go on. So far, as you could see from the plots that I showed, there doesn't seem to be any more, but if they are produced at much smaller rates, well, we are not yet sensitive to see them. We have to collect more data to see them. So that's actually something that we need to do. Yes? What is the magnitude of that, that machine up in the end? You said the 600 GeV was possible. Is, it, is that the magnitude you can get up there? In terms of the mass of the... Yes. No, actually, you could go... No, you could... With more data, you could actually continue to go to higher, all the way to just about eight or 900 GeV. But eventually, what we refer to as the Higgs, a standard model Higgs boson cannot have, from the theory, we know that it cannot have masses of much higher than one TeV or so. In fact, that was the way we designed this, these experiments. We knew that the window that you have to look for goes to about one TeV, like about 1,000 GeV and not much more than that. You don't really need to look for, because then if it's not there, then the Higgs mechanism is not the answer. You have to go back to the drawing board and there are other theories and there are other models that people have uh, proposed. Okay, let's take two more questions up there, sir, and then... And then. Yeah, the, the fact that the, the mass turned out to be 125 GPV, that is a discovery rather than a prediction. How many hidden variables are in Higgs theory that have to be pinned down before those masses could be predicted rather than discovered as has been done here? Well, the, the standard model has a big, big problem in that all the masses have to be put in yep. by hand. Right. They are, if you like, the free parameters of the theory. This is partially why we think that the standard model is incorrect in the bigger scheme of things. It's like a low energy version of a much bigger theory which would not need masses to be input to it, but it would actually predict the masses. You have obviously heard of super string theories, which is one candidate which could actually give the masses. So the, the, Higgs, the Higgs, of course, is still, the, this is why we keep telling or calling it the standard model Higgs. It's within the framework of the standard model. With all the, you know, uh, shortcomings of the theory in the sense that you still have to put in the masses by hand. Mass of uh, dark matter. Is there any theory that would relate that? Well, 
dark? No, the, the, oh, the, the dark, okay. Let me give you, for example, one theoretical um, model that actually has something to do with the dark matter, and that's supersymmetry. Now, if, that, if supersymmetry is what's happening out there in nature, then there are particles there which um, cannot actually uh, decay into anything because they become the least, uh, uh, the last stable particle in the chain of supersymmetric particles that can decay. And as such, then they would not, they would behave like neutrinos, if you like. So one candidate for one, if you like, from looking at it from the point of view of particle physicists, one candidate for dark matter is this, um, what we call LSP, which is the, uh, the um, you know, neutrino-like object which exists in supersymmetric theory. And, and if that object actually exists, then that particle would actually acquire its mass through the same Higgs mechanism that we have here, except that it would be the extended version of this with multiple Higgs, as we were just saying, that the standard model has only one Higgs, one neutral, but supersymmetric models have multiples of these Higgs bosons. But the mechanism for it massive, getting its mass or acquiring its mass would be the same. But, you know, we are, actually people are looking for dark matter in our um, experiments in many different uh, channels having to do with supersymmetric particles being produced and eventually trickling down to the ones which are stable and escape as like a neutrino. So do, those are, and there are actually even papers published already on it, on limits, of course, we haven't seen anything, but limits on their production. Okay, right, let's thank uh, Dr. Vaman again. <laughs>